everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, day one. I'm Caitlin McGurk. I'm the curator of comics and cartoon art here at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> uh, we are really excited to have you all back for our first fully, fully in-person festival since 2019. This is really special for us. Uh, how many of you are here at CXC for the first time? Wow. Oh, that is... That's really, really spectacular. I'm so thrilled to hear it. And um, I want to just mention a few brief things about the Billy Ireland. So our galleries, which are located just across this corridor by the windows on the second floor, they open today at 1 o'clock. They'll be open uh, today from 1 to 5, tomorrow from 10 a.m. until 7 p.m. So tomorrow's a really long day. We're also doing um, some uh, exclusive behind the scenes tours throughout the day tomorrow. There's gonna be a sign up sheet for those placed in the lobby around 9 a.m. and it's really a first come first serve situation. Uh, we do have to limit the group. So if that's something that you, you know, came all the way out here specifically to see, make sure you get your name on that list uh, first thing tomorrow morning. And I also hope you'll join us for our reception, which is from, uh, tomorrow from 5 to 7 p.m. It's a great chance to see the galleries. We're going to have a, a jazz trio here playing in the lobby. Uh, we'll have our awards um, reception and remarks as well. Um, lastly, I want to mention the exhibits that we have on display right now in the galleries. In the back gallery, we have up Celebrating Sparky, Charles M. Schultz, and Peanuts. <laughs> yes, we do. And that's a show that is uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of Charles Schultz, whose nickname was Sparky. Uh, the other gallery has still Racism in America, a retrospective in cartoons. And that's all artwork by Brumsick Brandon Jr. and Barbara Brandon Croft. Uh, Barbara is actually one of the special guests for CXC, so she'll be around tomorrow at the reception and at programs throughout the weekend. Uh, lastly, just more kind of housekeeping stuff, there is a uh, check-in table in the lobby where you can get name badges um, and you know, pronoun tags if you would like. So you can sign in in the back over here. And all of the restrooms are located on the second floor through the door at the top of the stairs to your left. There's a drinking fountain down there as well. So I think that's all the, the details. So uh, before I introduce our first program, I want to read a land statement. <clears throat> To date, the Ohio State University does not have an official land acknowledgement. In brief, this means that our university has yet to formally recognize the tremendous amount of territory and other forms of wealth that have been taken from Native Americans over the past several hundred years. However, there are faculty, staff, and students who are currently working to fill that gap. When this happens, Ohio State's land acknowledgement will have four defining features. First, we will recognize the tribes who were forcibly removed from their historic homes in service of the founding of the state of Ohio. Here, we will acknowledge the territories taken from tribes such as the Delaware, Miami, Oibe, Peoria, Potawatomi, Seneca, Shawnee, and Wyandotte were used to build Ohio State's six campuses. Second, we will recognize the tribes whose land was taken, often through brute force of lopsided treaties or lopsided treaties, and then sold to raise monies that contributed to the founding of the Ohio State University. Here, we will acknowledge that the Morrill Act of 1862 has a dark and bloody history that preceded the development of Ohio State and other land grant institutions. According to the Land Grab University's report, our university benefited from land taken from no less than 108 tribes and bands who are located as close as Michigan and as far away as California. Third, we will make certain that the land acknowledgement focuses on the past, present, and future. That is, recognizing these past wrongdoings, identifying the present harm that continues to be visited upon Native Americans, and envisioning a future for our Ohio State that includes engagement on, in ongoing di dialogue and reparative activities that are associated with these injustices. Fourth and finally, we will work directly with tribal leaders to ensure that Ohio State's land acknowledgement accurately reflects the perspectives, values, and traditions of tribal communities. Of course, that means we will not put forward a statement until and unless our university is in direct talks with leaders of all tribes that I have mentioned here. Thank you. Um, and one last note, <laughs> I would like to uh, thank the uh, CXC sponsors of all the programs we have going on this weekend, uh, including the, greatest the Greater Columbus Arts Council, the Ohio Arts Council, White Castle, and UBS. Okay, so now switching over to our very first program of the uh, th CXC Thursday. I'd like to introduce our moderator for um, exploring representation in comics. Uh, Andrew Kunka. Uh, Andrew Kunka uh, is professor of English at the University of South Carolina, Sumter. 
He is the author of autobiographical comics from the Bloomsbury Comics Studies series and the Eisner Award nominated The Life and Comics of Howard Cruz, Taking Risks in the Service of Truth from Rutgers University Press. He has also published on Will Eisner, Kyle Baker, Jack Katz, Crime Comics, and Dell Comics, among other topics. He also serves as book review editor for Inks, the Journal of the Comics Studies Society, on the board for the International Comics Art Forum, and as the Comics Studies Society Ombuds. He is currently co-writing The Rutledge Introduction to American Comics with Rachel Miller. Welcome, Andrew. Um, thanks everybody for coming. Um, so, uh, and thanks for joining. Yeah, for joining us for uh, exploring representation in, in comic studies. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists and then start with a few questions. We'll go until about 10:45 and then uh, open up the floor for questions. Uh, okay, it's not advancing. <laughs> it's on. Do you have any like? <laughs> There's no like animation or anything. No. Okay, I will advance it for you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Natalia Colon Alvarez is a PhD candidate candidate in the English department here at OSU. Uh, uh, specializing in popular culture and comic studies. Her recent research looks at the construction of space and graphic narratives through mapping and map making practices. She has written and presented on the construction of identities through space in graphic memoirs, the participatory culture forged by comics and pop culture fans, and how comics construct Puerto Rican identity in the wake of natural disaster and national trauma. Um, Next to her is Mikkel Bermeo uh, Isuzi, PhD candidate at the Spanish and Portuguese department here at OSU. Uh, Mikkel is a Crip and Queer PhD candidate at the Spanish, oh, I just said that. Uh, they research on Spanish comics and gender and sexuality with focus on nonfiction. They're also part of the creative writing in Spanish and Portuguese student organization. Uh, Caitlin Marisol Sweeney Romero is a PhD candidate in English here as well. She is a Latinx studies and US popular culture scholar with research interests in prison media, DIY culture, comics and zines by women of color and media portrayals of Central American Americans. She is at work on her dissertation, which explores how Latina content creators produce self images through their social media profiles that draw upon the challenge, uh, the challenge legacy media portrays of Latinas. She present, presently serves as the co-coordinator of programming and marketing support for the Latinx Comics, Comic Arts Festival at Modesto Junior College and as the social media officer for the Graduate Student Caucus of the uh, Comic Studies Society. So welcome to our three panelists. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, with with one uh, one question for um, for Natalia here, and go down the row, and just ask you to describe. You know, we've got a little brief introduction to what your research is, but if you could describe in a little more detail what your uh, what your dissertation topics are. Yeah. So. Um as uh, Andy said, I am right now very interested in sort of maps in comics and how comics and maps have a surprisingly intertwined sort of historical genealogy. Um, they are both uh, objects with which we uh, explore space and time. And actually, a lot of comic scholars um, think of comics as um, maps uh, through which uh, we see uh, time passing on the space of the page. And so I'm very interested in that, especially in how comics can um, include maps as narrative tools and objects, and how maps can also be um, storytelling devices that construct 
um, identity uh, in, in different comics texts. So that's what I'm um, focusing on in my dissertation. Thanks. So currently, I'm not focusing on my dissertation. You know, all job applications are tough. <laughs> uh, but if I had to say something, I would be talking about uh, two two things mainly: uh, queer studies, because I mean, they, through autobiographies, there are some wonderful comics in Spain uh, that talk about the mental toll that uh, being openly queer does to people because of what society does. Uh, and because of these job applications, I got into a certain kind of crisis with chapter two, of course. And I was, I thought I was going to do something about memory and how we understand our relative gender and sexuality through, in, in this case, uh, in our case, the Spanish dictatorship. Mm -hmm. But with these job applications, I was like, oh, I should maybe focus more on disability. <laughs> because, and suddenly I, suddenly super into this too. So, and I'm also focusing on autobiographies, but with, from parents of uh, uh, children with disabilities and how we shape our identities also when it's not only our uh, concerns, but uh, somebody else's. Because it helps us uh, to question both autonomy and uh, kinship and all that, and it's really, really interesting uh, to see how they they, uh, they intertwine, uh, how they combine this identity, both in German uh, gender and sexuality terms, but also with uh, disability. I don't know if that this makes any kind of sense right now. I mean, I just uh, you know, these couple of weeks has been exhausting, and I don't really. Sometimes I'm questioning what I'm doing again, but. This is, this, so, is, this is fine. <laughs> so, so what you're saying is you're a graduate student. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. It's really nice to see you, um, especially in human form. It's so exciting. Um, but I do focus on the Internet. So uh, switching to Zoom wasn't, I guess, too different as a person who spent most of their time on YouTube and Tumblr because they had really strict parents. Um, I'm Katie or Caitlin. Either one's fine, as Andy mentioned. Like Mikkel, I'm also in the job market, so I'm a little scrambled egg. Um, in terms of my brain, um, but I focus in my dissertation on what it means to be a Latina on the internet. I'm especially interested for those of us who are mixed race, who are queer, um, what the experience is of trying to navigate identity construction when we have increasingly more digital tools to use to do so. Um, and as a person who really enjoys doing my makeup, learned to do my makeup from YouTube, and especially have increasingly spent you know, tons of hours and time on sites like TikTok and Instagram, I feel like those are really important spaces where conversations are happening, not only in terms of media fandom, of the things that we care about and can meet other people People online who care about them too, especially if you don't have folks in your day-to-day -day life that maybe love the same things that you do. But for me in particular, I'm really interested in thinking about for Latinas, um, what does it look like to try to craft an identity when so often mainstream media has presented us with the same image over and over, right? Of it's always a very able-bodied, hyper-feminine, um, cis portrayal of Latina women that also abides by very kind of cis heteronormative codes of beauty. And as a person who has struggled with an eating disorder and also struggled for a long time with different facets of my identity, the internet was much more helpful and affirming for me to find other folks who thought about what it means to identify as a Latina than only looking to movies and television. Um, and so for me, I really think then about what does it look like for Latinas to self-represent or self-mediate through YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. Um, and especially with Instagram, we have so many comics creators who use Instagram to post their work there. And so I'm really interested in what it looks like to craft your identity online and also the, the way that we can then simultaneously use the comment sections and other types of social networking features online to respond to the ways that Latinas are representing us online to really challenge things or affirm things that we really enjoy and love. Great, thanks so much. Um, so since you've, already, you've started talking about your, your research and your dissertations and, and having being familiar with what happens through the dissertation process, we often start with an idea that we're going to do and then our, our research or some other things like uh, Mig Miguel, you talked about um, the market and things like that, Ch change, often change where we're going with the dissertation. I remember just on a personal note, 
having my first two chapters rejected because by my committee because they told me I'm writing a literature dissertation and not a history dissertation. So mm -hmm. I, had to, I had to start over uh, after, after a little bit there. Um, so, um, so could you talk a bit about the, the, any challenges or surprises that took your work in a different direction um, than you, you originally planned? And uh, Mikhail, since you've already started talking about that, why don't, why don't you uh, expand a little bit on what you yeah. discovered? Okay, yeah. Uh, I got here to always you actually thinking I was going to do something about memory and uh, representation of civil war, Spanish Civil War and dictatorship. Uh, and that's always kind of been in the back. Uh, but I was lucky to meet these wonderful people, I think, in uh, my first two semesters. I ended up writing a, a, a and a text on a comic by Emma Rios uh, on queer uh, queer studies, and that uh, that was in a period of time I wasn't really openly queer, uh, so that kind of uh, helped me to begin to write about it, because otherwise I wouldn't have allowed myself to write about these uh, issues, and that was like the first moment for me, serious moment of changing what what I'm doing. Uh, lately, the, the job market, one of these places I'm applying to asked for a, a course syllabus for, uh, and the first idea that made me wake up at 4.30 a.m. Uh, <laughs> was graphic medicine in Spain. And that was like, Oh wow! I do love it. I do have a lot of ideas, just in a in a minute. Mm -hmm. So that was like the latest. Of course, you know, five years may can do a lot to your mind and your decisions. But I'm just pointing the first one and the last one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. Uh, same same question, uh, Keila. Sure. Um, I think that the challenge I was having was that. Most of the time I was taking classes in my undergrad and then graduate experience that were not taught by folks who look like me and then also didn't feature content um, that I could relate to. And so to be really candid, I had no intentions of going to graduate school at all. One, because I thought you had to pay for it. And two, because I didn't have anyone in my immediate life who like had done this process. Um, and so I just kind of, you know, really felt the expectations from my family of like you get a degree in business or communications and you get a job that's corporate and close to home and then you can call your abuelita and be like, I've got all of the benefits you want me to have from this job, all is good. Um, and I had a professor, Bill Mediccio, um, at San Diego State who was like, mm, I think you should be in grad school. For one, you're a good talker. For two, you really enjoy pop culture. And I was like, what do you mean? Um, and so, you know, it was a very winding path that was kind of unconventional for me. And I mentioned that in case anyone here is a person who's maybe thought about it tangentially, but kind of thought, I don't know if I would be a good fit. I've been really surprised that it was a great path for me. Um, but I think in terms of the dissertation process in particular, I really struggled with trying to figure out how to write about identity in ways that I didn't just see already represented. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of the familiarization or f kind of familiarity that people have with Latinas, whether you identify as one or not, does come through mass media. And I found that that started to also kind of infiltrate the way that I would write, of feeling this pressure of like, if I'm going to write about Latinas, I can only write about our pain and suffering because that's all that we see represented in the media. Um, and so I think in the last few years, it's really been kind of a soul searching process of thinking about what does it look like to perhaps turn instead to the comics I'm reading in spaces like CXC and SoulCon, for example, by creators who I'm getting to know through like an exhibitor alley and getting to ask them about their process of creating narratives that maybe reference the pressures that we see come from mass media, but are actually building new story worlds where we can exist in more complex, nuanced ways. Um, and I think that's been sort of the most formative experience for me and has really taken my project in a new direction. Great. Okay. And Natalia. Yeah. So. Being a graduate student is challenging. <laughs> Being a graduate student of color in a predominantly white institution is challenging. Um, and also, I think that um, coming to, uh, I'm from Puerto Rico and like moving to the United States and starting a program 
Um, I started in 2017, which was, um, if you remember, Hurricane Maria. So that was five years ago. And that was my first semester at grad school when the hurricane landed in my in my in my home country. And so that was very challenging. Right. And sort of um, I think for me, it was this moment where I was like, does my work matter here? Like, why am I here? And I actually think that um, these events like CXC really helped me feel like I was in the right place at the right time, um, that comic studies matter, um, that pop culture studies matter. And it helped me feel um, sort of more at home um, in, in an otherwise very sort of alienating um, experience. Um, in terms of the, of, of the dissertation, I think that um, for me, sort of expand, because I felt like I had a bunch of ideas of for different projects. And um, I really, really liked maps. And I sort of held on to that. Um, originally, the dissertation was going to be focusing more on graphic memoir, because that's sort of what got me into comic studies. Um, but then the more I, I read and the more I wrote and the more I talked to my um, advisors who were like, think broader, think bigger. And I think that's also a challenge for, for some graduate students to sort of um, feel safe to make those broad claims and, and say like, oh, I am a scholar. I can make these um, forays into the, into the discipline um, because for me, it was always very hard to sort of think of myself as a scholar when I was still a student. Mm -hmm. Being a graduate student is such like a bizarre liminal space to exist in. Um, you're a student, uh, you're a scholar, you're also a teacher, um, but you're, you still rely a lot on mentors. So it's such a bizarre sort of um, in-between space. And I think that for me, one of the challenging things was sort of allowing myself to uh, believe in my ideas and say, like, I think this is important. I think this is fascinating and sort of um, have fun with it. And I think um, I also want to thank the Billy Ireland because um, I found um, community here um, with research and archival research. And I felt like uh, that has really bolstered my confidence in my own project. So Excuse me. So, Natalia, were you into maps like as a kid? Was that a no? The maps <laughs> thing was totally accidental. Um, I but I was I liked comics. But even that, um, some people ask me like, were you a very avid comics reader when mm -hmm. you were young? And I really wasn't. I loved um, the Peanuts and I loved um, Archie comics and then I loved Mafalda mm -hmm. um, and. That was it. <laughs> um, and it wasn't until I got to college, um, I went to college for uh, fine arts, for drawing. And um, when I was in college, I also fell in love with uh, the English department. And so I had a minor in English literature. And then suddenly I was like, wait, <laughs> comics does both of these things really, really well um, in interesting ways to tell stories visually, textually. And so I got really into comics and comic studies um, in college, and I saw sort of a path forward into something that I really enjoyed both reading and writing about. Um, and I didn't even know that there was a comic studies program or a comic studies anything until sort of my last years in, in college. Uh, and the maps thing was totally accidental. It was um, in a class for graphic memoir that I was reading, I was rereading Fun Home by Alison Bechdel for, for the zillionth time um, for that class. And Alison Bechdel uses a lot of maps um, in her uh, graphic memoirs. And I was like, what do these maps add to the narrative? Um, why is it important for her to include these in um, her father's life story and in her own life story? And that just sent me down the rabbit hole. And now I can't help but see how many maps um, are in comics and vice versa, how many comics maps we see just out and about um, just in our daily lives and how maps are very ubiquitous in our daily lives. So sort of that's what led me to this moment. Great. Um, 
So let, let's transition then into, into teaching because I feel like we've gotten some, uh, a good sense of, of, of where your research head, heads. So, um, so Caitlin, can you talk about how comics specifically fit in your teaching, especially when it seems like your, your, uh, your project is definitely like multimedia and focus. So where, where do comics fit in, in the, in the teaching process for you? Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, I think comics are really important to my teaching, uh, in part because I sign them every semester, um, but also because I think that what I have found to be one of the more enriching aspects of being in the classroom is like someone perhaps reading a comic for the first time. Um, for example, this semester, I'm teaching a literature class that I have organized around the idea of fandom in the frame. We're thinking about how our relationship to being a fan of pop culture and perhaps also being critical of pop culture um, is something that we see come up in many graphic memoirs, for example. Um, I'm teaching, for example, Christy Rhodes' Spit and Passion, um, as well as thinking about my favorite thing is Monsters, um, Maya Kovave's Gender Queer, of course. But I'm specifically asking students to think about how does the depiction of creators kind of talking about their love of pop culture um, really facilitate some of the identity development and construction that they're undergoing in, in a lot of cases in coming of age narratives. Um, and for me, that's been really generative to kind of talk with students about what does it mean to perhaps use pop culture as a window into thinking about different aspects of ourselves that we perhaps don't have language for or an understanding of quite yet, um, especially when we're much younger. Um, but additionally, I find that in kind of assigning comics alongside other types of text, whether it's music videos or film, it also really tasks students with thinking about, you know, what is the way in which comics are very much intertextual and engage with kind of the larger socio-political discourse that's happening across our culture. Um, and for me, I oftentimes find that in the work of creators as well, like Brina Nunez, Lawrence Lindell, Kat Fajardo, that what they're able to do in a few panels or a few pages, in my view, sometimes is much more impactful than what we see in a 200 page book. And so I think it's important as well when bringing comics into the classroom to not only bring comics that, of course, perhaps are legible to students by way of them being produced by a larger publisher, but also independently published works as well. Natalia, you go ahead and talk about your uh your experience teaching comics. Yeah, so um, as many um, or almost all English department graduate students start teaching English 1110, which is the basic sort of English composition course um, in the university. And I knew from the get go that I always wanted to include comics um, with whatever theme I was um, doing each semester for English composition. Um, and I think that comics present a very interesting case study for students to think about composition um, because they think so much, they get into the classroom and they think that they have to produce, you know, this um, just long form text like research paper, which they do. But also I found it important to think like that's not the only sort of composition out there. Right. And so I really liked giving them um, uh, fun um, multimodal projects or um, creative projects, and they really uh, enjoyed them. And so I um, assigned uh, a lot of different comics in, in the composition classroom. Um, and I remember specifically, I think that first semester, uh, I, oh, can you not hear me? No, just I was seeing. Something. No, that, that's a different microphone. Don't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that one's for the recording. This one's um, for the room. Yeah, I remember uh, teaching Little Nemo in Slumberland, and they found it so fascinating to think of um, these very beautiful comics being um, produced and read more than a hundred years ago. Um, but even like uh, as uh, Katie said independently published comics um, now that deal with um, big questions that they themselves are exploring, I found it very productive in the classroom. And finally, this semester, I'm teaching intro to comic studies. Um, and so for 45 students, it's a general education uh, credit. And so a lot of them come in not having read comics at all. And, you know, they are not afraid to tell me like, oh, I signed up for this class for the GE credit. And I'm like, well, OK, that's a little discouraging, but I'm going to make you love comics. And it is very uh, 
it is very rewarding when they start reading comics and they're like, wait, this is amazing. I never knew comics could do that. Um, we just finished reading Bitch Planet um, on Tuesday and I had students be like, I, like, how could they fit so many like contemporary issues in like this one volume of comics and I'm like that comics will get ya um, and so it's it's been very rewarding because um, both they can think a lot about the form right and and how to express things in not just text but visually as well but then they can also feel seen represented and um, they can feel like they're engaging with these broader topics in a very accessible way. And so I'm a very big proponent of comics in the classroom. Great, thanks. And Michael? Yeah, uh, me too, because I mean, I'm, so I'm not in English department. <laughs> and so I think of comics in uh, several different ways. I've been, and I'm influenced first, as, uh, two things I think right now. One, uh, teaching and studying is Spanish, and two, uh, history and literature. So one, I've been teaching from elementary Spanish to higher upper level courses for six years now. And I have seen the language, the anxiety language come produce. And through comics, I, I think it, it is helpful to approach language sometimes, uh, whether Elementary, well, I haven't had the chance to teach many because through in elementary, but I've been able to use bits and pieces. But yes, as students uh, go on in, in minoring or majoring in Spanish, I find it useful because it's less anxious, triggering to find a 200 page comic than a, a 200 or 300 pages uh, novel. And uh, considering that, for example, I'm teaching Spanish uh, culture during the dictatorship. And pedagogically speaking, for example, I thought maybe it's better to use this comic adaptation instead of the original novel. Which, I mean, of course, if they plan to go ahead, they should read the, the original. But uh, it's time consuming and uh, it triggers a lot of anxiety to, to read that 300 pages now and still very good and we can still learn a lot from that and again when they saw that they had to face in a week uh, like 180 pages they were like oh I cannot do this uh, but when we faced it they were like oh this is nice uh, this is actually nice and I could actually talk about a lot of things happening in the page and and they were uh, they were very happy to see that it's not, it wasn't the first time I'm, I'm using them and last year there were a lot of uh, amazing exchanges and they were surprised because they had most of them had never used one in class and again I guess lang the language barrier is important plus because I mean after six uh, this is my seventh year in the U S. And I've seen many, or many or more than enough panic attacks in class. So I know that I, at the same time, I have to be both conscious of that uh, anxiety in the class with language and life, and also be uh, scholarly uh, competent or just good. And uh, comics also do that. In, several different ways that novels or movies do. I use, I also teach them, of course, but I mean, it's, I think that's where I come from, right? Great. Um, since, um, Caitlin, you brought up uh, my favorite thing is monsters, and I'm about to, when I get back, going to start teaching that um, for about, I don't know, the fifth or sixth time. <laughs> but, um, and, and, and Natalia, you mentioned Bitch Planet. What uh, both of those works are not finished, mm -hmm. right? So how do you how do you approach teaching like a serial narrative like Bitch Planet or a book like My Favorite Thing Is Monsters when students get to the end and it's a huge cliffhanger <laughs> sitting, <laughs> sitting right there and and no 
you know, no uh, completion in sight. Well, we're finishing My Favorite Thing is Monsters on Friday, so I'll have a more refined answer on <laughs> Friday. Um, I will say with that book, um, you know, one of the things I decided to do is to actually put students in co-working pods where they're in small groups, and each time, um, I kind of sprung it on them. I was like, we're going to do analytical Rubik's Cube, thinking about the fact that with a Rubik's Cube, your task is to line up all the colors together, and, you know, you're trying to think about how things relate to each other, and I applied that mentality to reading this book that was much larger than anything we had tackled so far this semester. And I was like, so each time you're in a co-working pod and you've got one side or kind of one facet of this book that you're going to tackle. So, for example, you know, each day they come in, I've moved the tables around, they look a little nervous. Um, but basically, I have a printout of one of the pages from, from the comic. And I'm like, all right, you're, you're going to want to pick something you haven't sat with before. And so depending on the day, they're either having conversations with each other where they have to focus thematically on the pictorial or visual aspects of the text. In other days, they talk about kind of the intra-psychic or kind of identity development parts. Um, in other you know, facets, they're thinking about interpersonal relationships. Um, it's also been a way that I've been able to introduce some kind of narrative theory as well of getting them to notice, particularly, of course, with my favorite thing is monsters. You know, they were feeling pretty good after gender queer. They're like, okay, cool. I've got the panel thing done. It makes sense to me. Uh, or down, I should say. And then, you know, we went to Spit and Passion and they were like, okay, you know, panels are still kind of there. And then my favorite thing is monsters. They're like, where did the panels go? And so it's been a great way for also students to kind of think about what are the narrative tools that Emil Ferris is using. And that's, I found, been a way also that each time they come in, they know they're going to have a slightly different conversation based on the pages that they're tackling. Um, but it's also really given me the opportunity to sit with them in small groups and just kind of hear from them. What are the things that are standing out to you? And how are you working through a text that you're reading, in our case, over the course of two weeks, and thinking about how different that process of reading this particular graphic novel is compared to like Spit and Passion, for example, being separated into chapters and focusing on two years of Christy Rhodes' life. And then of course with Gender Queer, us having a kind of 20 year span that isn't separated into chapters. And I found that to be really meaningful. Um, but yeah, Friday I'll know how they feel about the kind of okay. ending. <laughs> Um, I've had students be very frustrated with uh, all the cliffhangers <laughs> and sometimes, you know, uh, what I'm teaching right now is a, it's a lecture course and it is sort of a survey, right? It's intro to comic studies. How do you even narrow that down? What, what do you even decide uh, to read or not? And so I tried to give them a wide range of texts. Um, and so they understand because I've talked to them and that's something that I, um, I always strive for is like transparency with my students and like, this is why I chose these texts. This is why we can't finish the run of um, this or that comic. Um, and they sort of understand that there's just not enough time to get through um, a full run of a comic, right? So um, this time it was Bitch Planet uh, that we only read the first volume, which covers the first five issues. And they, um, at, on Tuesday, they were like, but what happens to this? And I was like, I guess you'll have to read it. <laughs> um, and you know, like, that's on you now. Like, if you really enjoyed this, go out um, and, and, and read it. Go to the Billy Ireland or go and buy it. Like, uh, I, 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 I'm excited that they get frustrated in the sense that now I'm thinking like maybe they'll go forth on their own and discover the world of comics. But the same thing happened. We read um, America, The Life and Times of America Chavez, volume one, which also is the first six issues. The same thing, right? They're like, but what happens with this arc? And I'm like, I don't know. You tell me um, once you read it. So, but they also understand that, uh, to be able to get through a lot of these really cool texts that they've been enjoying reading, um, we need to cut from somewhere, right? And so, uh, and I think that always happens when you're constructing a class, sort of, I would love to sit down and just read full, you know, uh, runs of, of a comic, uh, but it's just not feasibly possible. Right. Um, and so I, I think they understand that, yeah. So yeah. they got me here talking yeah, about reducing anxiety and you're happy <laughs> you're enjoying the well, <laughs> yeah well <laughs> no, it's, it's frustration it's not anxiety none of them have been like i am anxious to know about what happens at bitch planet they're more like i would like to know and so yeah <laughs>
the, your, your answers are really interesting because I just got done, be, you know, uh, before shifting into my favorite thing is monsters, just got done teaching the Hernandez brothers. And that is, mm. that is a huge challenge to not only like select what to, what to teach, but that, yeah, I get, I get the questions all the time. And when I say like, well, you know, like, like you said, Natalia, find out, you know, <laughs> and I've had students ask me like, can, where can I get more of this? Yeah. And, um, and I'm like, you, this is, you've got 40 years of comics to read now. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, um, actually we're kind of getting close to, getting close to a quarter two. And so rather than, uh, starting in on another question for everybody, um, let's like open up questions, uh, to, to the audience. Does the audience have anything they want to know? Yep. Go ahead. <laughs> I can jump in to say that I decided that every comic I was going to give students focused on mental health because that felt really important. Um, and students really responded positively to that. Um, for example, Lauren Sedell's Couldn't Afford Therapy was one that I leaned on a lot, as well as Jen Woodall has, I think it's Marie and Worrywart, where the anxiety is manifested as a little worrywart that starts out nice and small and is red, and it's a black and white comic that, of course, as the anxiety gets worse, the comic becomes red, and students were like, I like the worrywart. Um, and that was really helpful as well to kind of get students to, like, I don't know, I guess hold space for the fact that I feel really strongly that a lot of us are going through a very difficult time. Um, I am a person who has really difficult mental health struggles and I feel that being candid in the classroom to my students of like, I think that your wellness as a person first and foremost matters to me and as a student of course that's important too but that can be kind of second. Um, I think that's a really important care practice and I think sometimes classrooms can feel more like a surveillance or policing space as opposed to a care space and so um, when teaching online, I really want to include things, of course, that have to do with mental health, but I also try to be cognizant of the fact that not everyone else is, you know, or not everyone, I should say, is out to their family or has a relationship with their family that learning at home is the same experience as learning on campus. And so I really also try to provide content warnings so that students can sort of self-assess their safety and determine what things they can read at home and perhaps during the pandemic, maybe what things they needed to read at a coffee shop or elsewhere to have those protective measures in place. I actually don't remember much from teaching in the, in the pandemic. <laughs> I'm in my fifth year now, so and in the Spanish and Portuguese department, it usually takes like three or four years to be teaching high level uh, courses. And it was not until my fourth year that I could teach them. Uh, so I don't really know. I mean, I've been struggling with anxiety and depression for 17 to 18 years ish. Uh, and the pandemic just didn't help much. <laughs> uh, so I cannot remember right now. I cannot, I don't know how I could make it, <laughs> actually. So I'm sorry if I cannot really... Uh... Yeah, the pandemic was awful. I think it was awful for, for everybody. And I really struggled. And... Um, you know, I think I, I sort of learned to be gracious with myself and extend that grace to my students. And just like uh, Katie, I really tried for them to understand that their well-being was first and foremost, like it's more important than homework. It's more important than the class. Um, and I, I, you know, had students say that they felt that it was a good space, like our Zoom classroom was a good space. Um, which is great because sometimes I also had to, I really like being among people and suddenly feeling very isolated. Mm -hmm. I was in a dark place. And sometimes you're teaching to a black screen because I really did um, want them to have uh, the privacy. You know, we were all sort of navigating how to teach online and I never wanted to ask them to turn on their cameras. But then it, for me, it was, definitely a very bizarre experience to suddenly not have that visual cues, uh, those visual feedbacks um, of like, are they getting it? Are they nodding? Are they smiling? Are they distraught? Um, and so not having that was very tough. 
in terms of teaching comics, um, I learned how to like use, so my partner um, bought like a fancy camera mm -hmm. and uh, we learned how to like set it up eagle eye view so we could have like the, the layout of the page. And so um, for me, it was definitely on the one hand, I was very torn up about it, uh, about teaching online, and I felt very disconnected from students, which was hard for me because I care a lot about my students. On the other hand, it was sort of exciting to learn how to teach comics in a different way. Um, I learned a lot about um, video editing and sort of like how I could um, include like, um, yeah, the images of the comics that I was teaching in my like pre-recorded lecture or whatever. Um, and so that was, if I had to say, the only silver lining <laughs> from my um, pandemic teaching experience. Um, I'm, you know, overall just glad to be back in the classroom with my students. Yeah, that, that's funny because I, when I started this semester teaching a class that I hadn't taught since the, like, first semester of the, the pandemic, I took a look and I'm like, wow, I really like prepared this class. Like I, I forgot completely what, what, I had, what I had done. And I, I looked in my like Blackboard folder, I'm like, wow, this guy prepared more, more than he ever has before. So um, that was, yeah, that was my silver lining too. Other questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, for making maps in comics. Okay. Well, I'd say uh, think about what, just like how you're writing a story, think about what is important um, for your audience to know, right? Something about maps is that there's always something that has to be excluded mm -hmm. for the map to be useful. And so think about, you cannot represent everything um, that exists in a map. That's just um, something that's not uh, feasible. So for you as a map maker, you need to think, okay, what do I need to include for this to be narratively useful? And what can I exclude um, to make this map work um, for the reader? And so I think that's one of the big questions that you have to ask yourself as a map maker and comic maker as well. Um, so, well, firstly, um, my previous classes where I taught comics, the students didn't need to create comics in my classroom, so I didn't um, really encounter that problem. This semester, though, their midterm project, which is due on Tuesday, is an autobiographical comic um, where they can represent whatever they want about their life. And these sorts of questions started popping up. Um, I had a student who um, she immigrated from India and she was like, I'm tired of explaining to people like my journey from India to the United States. Do I need to include that in my comic. And I was like, no, um, you do not have to. You can decide, again, what you want to include and what you want to exclude, right? You as the author of your story, um, because they're already thinking in terms of representation, okay, how do I represent myself on the page? These are new experiences for a lot of these students. They've never made comics before. Um, and so I did encounter some of those questions of like, do I need to talk about my personal identity? And I wanted them to understand that as the author, if they are comfortable sharing, sure, comics can be a great way to work through some of these um, um, thoughts and questions and issues. You're thinking about your own identity, but they don't have to be. They can be fun. They can be um, lighthearted. Um, so hopefully on Tuesday when they hand in um, their, their projects um, and they have to share with the class, so we'll see how that goes. But I did have some of those questions, yeah, pop up. I'll just say briefly, I really appreciate that question because I think it's a really hard one. Mm -hmm. um, 
it has a lot of tendrils to it. I will say this. Um, I think in having been a student that sometimes when there was a week in the semester that something about that the next people was assigned and the professor would look to me and say, Katie, you must have thoughts. And I'd be like, I didn't finish the reading. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it was very difficult and sometimes feeling a little bit on display um, in certain weeks. Um, it's really important to me as, a, as an instructor to think about how can I make sure that students are not only seeing, for example, disabled creators, creators of color, um, folks of marginalized genders in one week that's themed around representation, but instead how am I doing my due diligence to ensure that the scholarship that they're reading, the social media content creation that they're seeing, also features creators who are doing very nuanced work that might not necessarily be engaged with issues related to their personal identity. And I find that that sometimes helps to mitigate it of if the representation we so often see then can still perpetuate this idea that I can only tell one story about myself. I think giving students examples, and including students who don't share those identities, but examples of like the multitudes and nuances that folks possess, I think it makes it more possible to see yourself in comics. I don't think I've, I've assigned a, a a comic that just ends in a cliffhanger. I have assigned serial forms that it's like, well, you can read the rest of it, but not something like that. Um, I, we have time for a couple more, so right here in the front. I have, I personally haven't, although I would definitely love to. <laughs> uh, I've taught a course on film and I and it's, I know it's still not comics but I, we dedicated a week and a half to uh, representations of disability and I'll actually the course I've prepared for my the course syllabus that a couple of job applications has uh, I've decided to build one on Spanish graphic medicine mm -hmm. and I got excited just by writing it. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm hoping that at some point, whether in those universities or elsewhere, I would love to teach that. Um, so for me, this semester, I sort of framed graphic medicine um, within sort of our uh, weeks talking about autobiographical comics because that's such a big sort of subset of graphic memoirs. We have a lot of like graphic medicine um, narratives and it's also such a rising um, sort of subset of comic studies, right? There's a lot of um, graphic medicine panels and um, conferences and I think it's important for them to sort of also see what's like contemporary uh, comic studies, what are we focusing on now? And I think that's a big, um, a big issue there. Um, one of, they have, uh, their final project is, uh, it's an archival research group project. And one of the groups is focusing on graphic medicine. Um, and so that way they can also sort of expand on that, um, once they present with, uh, their, the rest of their classmates. That question in your earlier comment about the autobiographical comics making assignment you do just reminded me, the first, I do the same thing, and the first time I did it, almost every student did a graphic medicine, like, really? comic, gra and, and we hadn't even talked about it, and I didn't, and then, so I said, you know, a after they, they all did their presentations on them, there's a thing called graphic medicine, and you're all doing it. <laughs> so, so now I've started working that that end of the class more. It was really kind of fascinating that that's what they all kind of latched on to when given the opportunity to do an autobiographical comic. Um, let's do one more question right here. Happy question. I think it's important to combat white supremacy uh, in all situations all the time. Um, and so I guess my response would be to really help 
kind of students think about what are the ways that language is often mobilized as a tool of supremacy and of power. And so really ensuring that in the first few weeks of the semester, we're thinking about the interconnected layers of ableism, racism, sexism, transphobia, homophobia, I think is really crucial. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think that um, noticing the ways in which comics oftentimes is a white space and perpetuates white supremacy is really important. Mm -hmm. I do, I do mention, I mean, I do mention uh, whenever we're facing whatever it is, if there's violence or sexism or racism, I always warn them, <laughs> just like a week before that. And since from day one, they know about my positioning. Uh, we can, and we try to face them in two ways. First, at a, a personal, both on also ideological level of what this means and also we at, after talking about it we uh, often very often we try to just then change into just uh, understanding what they're trying to do graphically or narratively mm -hmm. uh, just to be aware of the things the obvious things that may be doing wrong but at the same time uh, I try to understand and the the narrative purposes and do they does this help? Is this really appropriate or not? Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a lot of tensions uh, yeah. there, uh, I, yeah. and it's I, not always convincing. But I think the content warnings are are very important, um, and as well, like just. Uh, making it very clear that we are not going to repeat that language out loud in class. Like even if it's in the text, we are not reading that. We are, you know, um, because we are not um, enacting that violence in our classroom, right? Um, so I think that's also very important um, to, to make clear for students. Great. Uh, that was a great question to end on. And so uh, we're butting up against the next panel in here. So uh, let's give a round of applause to our, our panelists for a great discussion. Thanks for those great.